afternoon, everyone. Everybody out? Anybody out there? Okay, just making sure. Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, second event of uh, Parents Weekend. We're delighted to see all of you here. Some of you I saw early, bright and early this morning at uh, 8.30. Uh, others I remember seeing from last year, so it really is a pleasure to see uh, all of you here uh, this morning, this afternoon. Um, the title of this panel is Creative Approaches to the Issues Facing Today's Newsroom. And I can't think of a more important topic um, than the one that you're going to um, uh, hear talked about today. And I think I just want to underscore the, the creative part of it. And that's one of the things that we try to do here at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, which is to emphasize innovation, creativity, experimentation, because we're confronted, as you know very well, in the media and journalism industry with all these tremendous changes taking place. And so we really have to be creative and innovative, uh, not only in responding to them, but to leading to create best practices that practitioners will then uh, follow. I can think of uh, no better guide to this discussion than my colleague Geneva Overholzer. She is one of the most creative and innovative people in the industry. She has this wonderful combination of having traditional media legacy chops, having worked at the New York Times, having worked at the Washington Post, and an uh, editor of the Des Moines leading newspaper. So she really knows Pulitzer, all that stuff. But she has also been uh, leading a forum on a weekly basis to bring in the most innovative, thoughtful, forward-looking um, folks in the business. Some of them, I, I looked at them and I said, why are we bringing in a 12-year-old to talk about some of these issues? But the older I get, everybody looks like a 12-year-old, I discovered. Um, but it's been a very exciting uh, series that she has designed for the faculty and for the students. Um, and so again, I think that no one could do a better job of talking about the uh, creativity that's inherent in this moment of great change than the director of the journalism school, Geneva Overholzer. So without further ado, let's give Geneva a very warm welcome <laughs> in her leadership. Thank you so much, Ernie. You know, he's is such a gracious, gracious introducer, and I appreciate that very much. I bring you glad tidings about journalism and journalism education. This is not necessarily what you hear every day. So we are here to make sure that you do know that there are wonderful stories to be told. If you are parents of undergraduates, I want to assure you that your students are getting a wonderful mix of really basic skills, critical thinking, good writing, and ability to communicate reliably and credibly, but also mixed with a very interesting, innovative uh, emphasis on multi-platform storytelling and on entrepreneurialism, things that when I went to journalism school, one would have been kicked out for mentioning, you know, like branding and how you create, how you worry about audiences and reaching them and how you worry about how you're going to pay for what you're doing. So um, we also have two wonderful um, master's degrees in journalism that each in their own way is equipping people to go forth and do all kinds of jobs that really meet public information needs. So what I thought we'd do today with this remarkable group of colleagues is give you a sense of the ways that we are innovating and leading change with different constituents. And I want to start to my left with Andrew Lee, who is going to sort of address the question of how within our own academic programs, um, we're changing the way that we teach and do journalism. Andrew is directing our digital media programs, and he just is joining us this year. He's one of, one of our wonderful new hires. Andrew's new book, The Wikipedia Revolution, How a Bunch of Nobodies Created the World's Greatest Encyclopedia, is garnering attention all over the world. His previous academic work was at Hong Kong University and also at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, where he created their pioneering new media program years ago. 
And after founding, he did that after founding one of the first dot coms in New York. So he, he really has been a pioneer. I first met him there when he was developing, um, for those of us on the Pulitzer board, the first guidelines for the Pulitzer Prizes to accept digital multimedia submissions. I give you Andrew. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> So it's a great pleasure to be joining the USC faculty here. Um, I've, I've had a lot of engagement with USC students and graduates over the years. Uh, USC is an overseas program, so I've seen a lot of students come over to China, Hong Kong, and to, to other places overseas, and always been impressed by them and impressed by the collaboration that truly exists on this campus. So I was uh, thrilled to get the uh, chance to join the faculty and engage in classroom uh, in the classroom setting with the students that have been phenomenal so far. Uh, as, as Geneva said, we're trying to make smart, ethical, multi-platform, multidisciplinary uh, students, ones that will be leaders in the industry. And we are entering into a phase where the students that we're getting in the classroom have never known a world that wasn't digital. And that's a really fascinating uh, dynamic we have in the classroom, that uh, not that they don't respect what has come before us in television, newspapers, and magazines, but they can think in a whole dimension that isn't constrained by what we see as um, the mass media or the conventional media. And that's a really interesting thing to see uh, in the classroom. They're teaching me, as I'm teaching them as well, um, how they view the world and how they see their career is going. And as, as Geneva said, what we want to do is foster in them a sense of entrepreneurship that um, there are very many worthy news organizations to join, but there are a lot of news organizations to start up. And we have a lot of opportunities now with the internet reaching so many more people than we had uh, ever reached before. And we see a lot of our graduates go out there and try brand new things, new products based around video, pictures, audio. Um, and it's, it's really a great opportunity to be here in a university that we always say is kind of a, a snapshot of what the United States will be long term, right? So many different types of uh, ethnic groups, uh, so many different industries, so many different concerns uh, that it's the ultimate laboratory for the students here. And I think even more so than New York City, where I was teaching for over seven years. And I, and I found this a much more interesting mixing bowl uh, than even New York City. So uh, I hope you enjoy your visit here and you get a sense of what we're trying to do here. And hopefully from the excitement you hear from your sons and daughters, you'll, you'll see that there's a lot of great things going on here. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. You gave me the great cue with mixing bowl. Um, think of this as concentric circles we started within our own academy. We are doing journalism in, I am convinced, the most interesting laboratory you could imagine, this great city. So diverse, so future-oriented, so filled with vibrant energy, so challenged with many problems. Um, and, and the next up is Bill Sellis, who heads one of our really interesting um, news outlets, which works within our immediate community, a very interesting um, community of South Los Angeles, which has, over the years, perhaps not had its own voice heard as much as we feel that it should be. Bill comes to this uh, post here at the university with a distinguished background as an education reporter at the New York Times, before that with the Wall Street Journal. He's written one book already and has another one just about to come off the presses, or at least in that awful phase of index, as many of you authors know. It's the worst, most painful period, but it also means that he's really completed it. And um, Bill is going to tell us about a number of ways in which we are working within the community. Bill Sellis. Thank you. I want to use Andrew's remarks as a, as a launch for, for what I want to talk to you about today, and that is um, how this city really is one of the best learning laboratories any journalism school could offer its students, uh, much more than New York, uh, because I'm an alum of the Columbia Journalism School also. And because the community here, South Los Angeles especially, is so fluid, we really are giving our students um, lessons in how to cover uh, the changing demographics of 21st century America and helping them understand and bridge uh, differences between communities 
Uh, in South LA, we have, uh, our students have reported the tensions between African Americans and Latinos. Uh, we're reporting um, what the recession looks like for working class and poor people. Uh, we are reporting the experiences of newly arrived immigrants and how they are using uh, an increasing number of examples of uh, faith-based uh, initiatives and programs in the community which have always been a mainstay in urban uh, settings like South Los Angeles and we're all wrapping it up as Andrew uh, shared with you with multimedia. Uh, many of these stories are long-standing stories and so we study the history, the underpinnings uh, through reading the Kerner Commission report, for, for example, that came out in 1968 after the 1960s riots in many American cities so that students today understand um, the forces at play in, in urban uh, communities. And we wrap it all up in multimedia through video, uh, traditional text stories, uh, audio, I hope next semester with interactive graphics. And our project, the South LA uh, Report, covers an area of 885,000 people. If South Los Angeles, the collection of neighborhoods, incorporated cities, um, was incorporated itself, it would be California's fourth largest city, uh, eclipsing Oakland. Um, the final piece of this project in involving uh, our students um, the community members who are beginning to contribute to the website in more numbers and uh, a high school literacy, literacy project that is also tucked into this. Uh, we also engage the PR students at our school through the Tri-Site uh, student-run public relations agency to help us figure out ways to make inroads into a community uh, that hasn't always trusted mainstream institutions and journalism. And we're now, this is the start of our second year. We won a, a grant from the Knight Foundation last year, uh, which we're, we're very happy to win. We, the, the Knight Foundation, through the J-Lab, uh, received more than 300 applications from community organizations, colleges, and universities across the country. They funded eight, and we're one of them. So we're, we're doing uh, a lot here, and um, I think internally we always think we're not doing enough, but we actually, we actually are pretty far ahead of the curve uh, uh, compared with other journalism schools in the country. Thank you, Bill. Vicki Porter um, is going to address another way in which we reach out, and that is to the field itself, continuing education to the professionals in journalism and also in public relations. In Vicki's case, she heads one of our most uh, interesting um, centers, and it's the Knight Digital Media Center. Uh, before founding this center in a, a sort of a previous incarnation of it, Vicki had a 30-year career in journalism, um, editing a couple of community newspapers, sharing in a Pulitzer gold medal while she was city editor of Denver, and most recently heading the uh, chief editor of the um, Desert Sun in Palm Springs. So, Vicki? May I say one other thing? Absolutely. I'm tweeting the Savannah. Oh, that's right. I was we're to we're say. all tweeting. So we're not being rude. <laughs> yeah. We really aren't. <laughs> and if you're tweeting, the hashtag is ASCJParent. Okay, go ahead, Vicki. Uh, thanks, Geneva. Um, this is, uh, uh, has been an absolutely an extraordinary place for me to be uh, after leaving uh, the newsroom after several decades, as Geneva pointed out. What we do at KDMC is, um, frankly, trying to, and I, I excuse the immodesty, trying to save journalism and good journalists for the 21st century. That's on our website. That's our job. And it's quite... Um, uh, it, there's some heavy lifting involved. Uh, as you know, the transformation that the, the industry has been going through, not just in the last couple of years where the uh, financial, financial meltdown has brought it so, so clear to everybody, but for the last couple of decades. I bring leaders uh, from top newspapers, it started out with top newspapers in the country, and also have 
now we're going into public media, public radio station uh, managers and leaders, trying to help them figure out strategies for becoming multi-platform news organizations. Not giving up newspapers, not giving up radio, but seeing themselves as news and information providers that are capable of serving you, an audience, across a number of platforms. Um, it's extremely exciting, but you also need to know from the parents' point of view, we involve students as much as we can in our programs, and particularly uh, through this device and through um, uh, their own laptops, they will blog our sessions, make their own observations and comment on what happens in these discussions, trying to engage them in thinking about, again, the strategic thinking that needs to go into newsrooms. Uh, and we've also taken on a new, um, uh, I guess, discipline, and it's something that I, in the newsroom, my reporters never worried about where the money came from. And you've heard Geneva mention it, and it's kind of a theme uh, that's going on now in our classrooms, and that is entre thinking entrepreneurially, both as news organizations trying to reinvent themselves from the in inside out, but also for all those thousands of journalists who have lost their jobs within the last few years, they're still good, they're great journalists, and we're trying to teach them how to be good business people, how to take their great ideas for news and information in a digital environment and figure out how to make money doing it. And it, there's, um, as David will talk about, there are a lot of people out there trying to figure out what our new business models are. I have to share that we had our first news um, entrepreneur boot camp uh, last May, right after graduation. Brought in 14 people who competed out of a, a group of 200 people for an opportunity to spend a week with us, expenses paid, learning how to develop their ideas into solid, sustainable pitches and to find the money and how to operate the business. And I'm feeling good. I, I thought I'd feel good if I got one who was doing something well. And I have to tell you, we have at least two or three that are, I've seen a couple on uh, local TV. I've, uh, I know one has joined in a major in, um, national investigative network. Um, that's the kind of, I think, future that is ahead of journalism, and it's exciting. The students are going to learn how to entrepreneur. They're going to learn how to to, to really develop their own channels of information and their own brand, which is, again, what we're trying to do with journalists, and not depend on working for the LA Times for 20 years or the New York Times for 20 years, because those jobs might not be there. But there are a lot of other opportunities out there. So we're very excited, because the school is just kind of all, as you see, it all kind of weaves together. Speaking of weave together, the next circle out is our work to serve our field by carving out new knowledge and enriching our understanding of journalism's challenges and opportunities. Too often the debate is this sort of snarky one, you know, no, micropayments aren't going to work, and no, there is no role for government or public policy. And the fact is, of course, all of this bears being researched. So David Westfall, I have to consult my notes here because he's my husband, you'd think I would. Uh, <clears throat> while teaching both about entrepreneurialism and emerging media models here at Annenberg, also is doing research and deep reporting on, uh, with our communication leadership, communication leadership, Center on Communication Leadership, and the online journalism review, which sort of coexists with the Night Digital, Digital I Media Center. That. And he is the former head of the Washington Bureau for McClatchy Newspapers, and former managing editor of the Des Moines Register, and also, like Vicki, a former community newspaper editor. Thank David. you, Geneva. Thank you, Geneva. Um, Vicki's uh, description of the, of the new uh, model and the new future that, uh, that awaits journalists um, is happening in the classroom uh, at Annenberg, and it's really fun to be part of that. Um, the dean has a new initiative um, called uh, Economic Literacy and Entrepreneurship that we're very excited about. And um, I'm going to talk about the, the second of those E's, entrepreneurship. Um, Jeff Cowan and I, the former dean at Annenberg, are teaching a course called Entrepreneurship and the New Media. And I want to take you inside the classroom for just a second this past week where the students went around the table and talked about their end of the semester big project, which is to write a feasibility study for a new media startup, brand new enterprise, a brand new company. 
Uh, and these, you know, these were mostly news-based uh, initiatives, uh, fascinating uh, cross-section of ideas, everything from starting a um, news site for neighborhoods in West Denver uh, to um, starting a website for African uh, students and young adults who are relocating to other countries and, a, you know, kind of an informational site for, for them to um, uh, probably the most in intriguing one was uh, a, a website by a, a, a graduate student from Finland who has the idea of a uh, handheld app uh, that when, when you got close to a McDonald's or a, you know, <laughs> Carl Jr.'s would, get, would give you the menu of what's available there and give you information about it, including calories and you know, trans fats and all that kind of stuff, uh, so that you could kind of quickly decide, uh, you know, is it worth it to you to spend those extra 300 calories? Um, and the interesting thing about this really is that, and I think he's right about this, this has really interesting advertising potential because if you're, if you're one of these businesses, you want to get in there and tell your story. You know, here's what, here's what our business is doing to make sure that you can have a healthy, healthy meal. So he's really thinking, he's thinking uh, getting consumers there, but he's really, he's really thinking advertising. And of course, that's, that's as Vicky said, Something that um, you know, I, I, I've been in journalism several decades as well, <laughs> and and we never used to think a whole lot about that. Uh, and now uh, the students in our class uh, are, are thinking much about it. And and here's the really interesting thing about it: Jeff Cowan asked at, when we finished our, our going around the table, how many of you actually plan to do this? You know, do this startup once you've done the feasibility study. And a majority of the 22 students in the class raised their hands. They're going to take their feasibility study, at least they hope and think at this, at this point, and implement it and do it. And the thing is, you, you can because the cost of starting um, a business in the, in the new media are next to nothing or can be next to nothing. The point, the cost of entry is the barriers to entry are exceedingly low. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that outside the classroom that, I, that I'm looking at is the new business models that are available to startups as we see the legacy media starting to lose their own business model, uh, which was to have these big monopoly businesses that were capable of extracting adver advertising because they were the only business in town. They're not anymore, and their model is, is eroding. But the fun part of this is that there, I mean, there is a tremendous explosion of um, startups in, in, in media, in news media, and um, they're mostly still looking for their revenue model. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, this is young yet, but some of them are making a decent living. There's a, there's a, there's a new site in West Seattle that's pulling in $100,000 in revenue uh, in its second year in business. So it's not, it's not like it's a desert of, of money out there. But, you know, as, as, we, as we watch all this happening, um, again, those of us who have been in the, in the old business that's fading have, have watched this with trepidation. What is, what is it going to mean for the future and so on and so forth? The students don't see it that way. They see tremendous opportunity, and in fact, they're right. There is tremendous opportunity, and it's really, it's really fun to be part of that. Thanks, David. Next up. Um, we put all these attributes together to do the journalism here, and we have a very rich menu of uh, media outlets uh, in all kinds of laboratories. You all know this uh, because your students tell, them, tell you about them, I'm sure. And really, it's not that we think this is replacing the hollowing out of legacy media, but we do believe, we know it to be true, that in providing information in the public interest to the communities that we serve, we are helping address that growing gap between the public's needs and, and what legacy media are able to contribute. One of those news outlets, which is reaching particularly broadly, is our newest creation, Neon Tommy. And here to tell you about it is Mark Cooper, director of Annenberg Digital News, who has himself ranged widely, having written about politics and culture across the country and around the world for, uh, should I say it? 
three decades or so. <laughs> There's a theme here. We do have young professors as well. You know, so. <laughs> Andrew, and even younger, our new Robert Hernandez, who's 32. Talk about having people who are 12 up here. Um, so Mark's work has uh, appeared in dozens of publications ranging from The Atlantic, Harper's and the Los Angeles Times Sunday Magazine to Rolling Stone and Playboy. He has worked in documentaries and in radio, and he was editorial director of the very interesting Huffington Post off the bus campaign project, a distributive journalism, a very pioneering project. Mark. Uh, thank you, uh, Geneva. Uh, I think that uh, if, if you could think of one difference between uh, going to a journalism school now as opposed to uh, maybe 20 years ago, I think, say, if you entered journalism school in 1983, and you, you could go into school and you could kind of you know, do your classes and skate by and come out uh, on the other side of the membrane in 1985 and nothing would have changed in the outside world. I mean, you wouldn't have missed anything by being in school for two years. Uh, now, of course, uh, in digital terms, every two years is like 10 years. So if you uh, bunker yourself away for two years, you could miss 20 years of development. Uh, so one of the mindsets that we're trying to change here, uh, and really this has come, we haven't had much of a choice because uh, Dean Wilson and uh, our director, Geneva, have been behind us going like this. It hasn't <laughs> been like a big choice. Uh, but uh, one of the differences in mindset here is that we, can, we would be doing a disservice to the students if we said, okay, honey, you're here for two years, take it easy, relax, you know, we're going to shelter you and take care of you, and then magically after two years you're going to get your master's degree and you're going to pop out of the egg and everybody's going to want you to work for them. Uh, doesn't work that way any longer. Uh, I'm not sure it ever did, but it certainly doesn't work that way now. So our intent is to push uh, uh, our students as quickly as we can. In, in, in our case, at Neon Tommy and some other classes we run, uh, at least for the graduate students and increasingly for the undergraduate students, we try and push them into the real world of reporting in the first day. And that doesn't mean, when I say the real world of reporting, that doesn't mean just going out and doing practice drills in the real world. It means producing journalism that is seen in the real world. So the publication that we do uh, here, the online multimedia publication, Neon Tommy, it isn't an art project and it isn't homework and it isn't uh, just inward looking and it isn't just a scratch pad. It's out there trying to compete uh, in the real world today so that students um, uh, who are working for us begin as, you, you've heard all of these catchwords, but they're real. They begin to build their own brand, they begin to build their own audience, they begin to build their own name. This morning we have a student uh, uh, who wrote a story um, about uh, her futile uh, uh, attempt to get the Metropolitan Transit Agency to comply with the Public Records Act and she went and confronted the board yesterday and then wrote about it and that story as we now say in web terms that story is going viral this morning it's getting linked all over the place because people like to read stories like that where they see a courageous and assertive student who is taking on a public agency that's the kind of work we're doing and uh, I think we're being successful at it. The students are highly motivated and I can tell you as a parent of somebody uh, that has students more or less your age who goes to another, went to another university on the other side of town, um, uh, I can tell you that, uh, um, you know, uh, even with this economic downturn and even with the uh, collapse, as people call it, of the legacy industry, uh, legacy media industry, our students get jobs because they come out and they're prepared. Uh, and just by pure coincidence, the last night I heard from three students who graduated in May who were talking about the great new jobs they have. Uh, one of them is in legacy media, one of them is in television, and one of them is in new media. And uh, they're using all the skills they learned here. So I think that they're getting, I modestly think, that your students are getting a great current 
education here and that the school is really, uh, if it's not on the cutting edge, it's, it's a half an inch away from it. Now you all know that each of these people could have talked about additional, in the case of Mark, for example, additional news outlets here, the Annenberg Television News, yes. which as you, many of you know is one of our great strengths, Annenberg Radio News, Impact, our news documentary program. We could have talked about other kinds of research. We are blessed, as Ernie said so, so well and, and correctly at the parents' breakfast this morning, we are as a journalism school blessed to be partnered with a communication school where rich scholarship and research opportunities open themselves and, we, and there's a wonderful and increasing intertwining of those two schools. We could have talked about uh, many more of our centers. We have a wonderful uh, health journalism fellowship. We have great arts programs and um, we could have talked about other ways of working in, in our communities. In Alhambra, we're addressing the question of how you bring together to address public policy issues communities that speak English, Spanish, and Mandarin. Um, and we could have talked about many of the other things we're doing in our classrooms. But this gives you a good taste uh, of the kinds of things we're doing and you all have lots to contribute to us and I'm sure questions. So we want to open the floor to all of you. Any questions or comments you have, we welcome. It'd be fun for us to hear maybe where you're, where you're from. There are microphones on both sides and if you're way in the middle, I'm sure we can pass them over as well. So just raise your hand if you have a question. Um, here's one right in the front row and then toward the back. Well, we'll start toward the back, I guess. That's fine. All right. We had one in the front, right? Yes, right up here on the end. Thank you. Is this on? Okay. Um, so do, do you all feel like that newspapers are all going to end up being digital and that you won't have real newspapers anymore? No. 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 Newspapers, you will all, there will be a print, I'm, I really believe there will be a print product. It may be, it might not be seven days a week, it may be um, uh, reverse publishing, it may be something that actually is repurposing something that went on the web first. <laughs> It, it'll also depend on where it is. If, if it's a small community versus a metropolitan, or right now, and uh, David follows this much more closely, the, the experiments that are going on with New York Times, partnering with a number of different uh, uh, new news organizations to create what could be the first real national newspaper. Um, well, you just blogged about this with uh, uh, Russ Stanton. Why don't you mention that coming? Well, yeah, Russ, Fenton, Russ Stanton, who's the editor of the Los Angeles Times, um, was also in our class uh, this week. And um, <clears throat> you know, oftentimes now, when when uh, someone comes to class and and they're fine with this, <clears throat> we we write blogs about it. And in fact, uh, uh, several of us uh, wrote blogs about Russ's visit. Um, and Russ, uh, you know, Russ believes that the the printed Los Angeles Times Times will be around for for decades. And and but. Uh, he also said in class that what the what the, the model they're going to move to, which Vicky uh, hinted at, was sort of a web-first model. They're going to really put their firepower behind the web. The the printed product then becomes sort of a, um, a byproduct of all of the work that they've done, sort of that day and and perhaps beyond. But the, the so the, the the printed newspaper really will come will be a subsidiary thing in terms of the. Journalism. It will be a long time before, I think, before it, it becomes a subsidiary in terms of income, uh, revenue. Because even today, uh, most newspapers get 90% of their revenue from the printed uh, newspaper and 10% from their web operation. So there's, it's going to be a long time before that flips. Uh, but uh, but, but journalism-wise, that's where they're going to put their effort. N newspapers already are digital. Uh, their digital readership is infinitely greater for the most part really? than their hard copy. And the only, uh, the only slight, uh, I don't know if it's a dissent, but the skepticism that I would introduce into the discussion is that uh, I do think one can affirm that the digital revolution is in fact a revolution. This is not just a change in platform. This is a revolutionary change. 
and uh, just as much as the invention of the printing press was. And uh, we're about 20 years, yeah, depending where you want to start the clock, we're 20 or 30 years into the digital revolution. If you had tried to guess in 1490 where the printing press was going to lead, you probably would have been wrong because it was invented to propagate the Bible and it wound up producing the Enlightenment, uh, which was far from the Bible. So, uh, and they still print the Bible. So it, it's very difficult to say what the synergy is going to be between these different platforms. But I, I would say to you, if you think that newspapers are going to continue to exist, you know, fundamentally as they exist now, I'd say that's a bad bet. But that's my view. So but let's give this gentleman his chance now that he has it. I appreciate that. Am I on? Does that work? Okay. Yeah. I worked in the news business for 25 years in San Diego, anchoring the news, mostly broadcast journalism. And I left the business in 99 because I really was frustrated with the lack of objectivity, with the fact that there was a template that they worked off of. There was a lack of open-mindedness on the part of people. Um, and to me, I think that it's unfortunate to see what has happened overall with the news business over the last 10, 15 years because there's a sense of advocacy journalism today, whether it be Fox on the right or MSNBC on the left. There's this sense to me that they choose what to cover based on their own political persuasion. So what I was wondering is, what are you teaching in the classroom today to get us back to where we used to be in journalism? I studied Edward R. Murrow. I studied a lot of the, the great reporters that we had in World War II and coming out of World War II. And there was always this sense that you'd left your own political feelings, values, judgments at the door when you walked into a newsroom. What are you telling students today so that we can get back to true objectivity within our newsrooms so that the American people can get a better understanding of what's really going on rather than the side that they want to portray? I might take one stab at that, actually. I, uh, it's a very important question and means a lot to all of us. I, I think we can assure you that we are teaching pretty much the same fundamentals that you and I learned when we were uh, receiving them in journalism school. But it is a much more complex question today than it was for us. Uh, my own view is that there will be a lot of different answers as a lot of different journalism emerges and that there will be partisan voices that some people will choose to follow and that the fundamental ethic there needs to be transparency. If you are coming from a certain point of view, as long as you've got truth in advertising about it, then you are a, a legitimate part of the landscape. I firmly believe, along with you, that it is really critical that we have opportunities as members of the public to, to get news from organizations or individuals attempting to present it to us as full and fair and comprehensive and as possible. But I also believe that we as members of the public are going to play a role in this by, based on the decisions that we choose um, to make about what we consume. And, this news literacy question which Bill raised is a very important thing. In the end, the quality of the information we emerge with from this revolutionary period will be in large part tied to the high quality we do or don't demand. So that would be one thing I'd say, but I'm sure others would want to add. I think that's a really great concern. And I think that's one reason why teaching the history of the craft is really important, because the types of values you talked about were mandated by law. Right? We had a fairness doctrine that it has been stripped now in terms of the airwaves. Um, there was a public responsibility of, the, the, back then, the big three networks in their newscasts, because they were using public airwaves, to air news that was balanced and served the public. Today, that's all been stripped away. So you have, as you said, very partisan, very uh, commercially influenced news, if you even want to call it news these days. Um, so that's a real big challenge. And as Geneva said, I think now that the internet and that we have the tools that the public can be part of that process of ferreting out truth from fiction or from uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, 
Uh, that's one thing I wrote in my, in my book, in Wikipedia Revolution, saying that this is an encyclopedia that not the rich or the winners or the commercially uh, uh, viable folks have written. It's an encyclopedia that the people have written on the internet. And that's why it's the number five most popular website in the world. Right. The only websites that rank above Wikipedia are Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft. And it's because it's non-commercial that people have consistently found that volunteers on the internet have come up with a pretty good body of knowledge that people can rely on. And that gives you some hope that maybe this democratizing medium of the internet has some role to play in getting fair, balanced news out there. And not the Fox fair and balanced, but real fair and balanced news out there. I, if I could just add one more thing, and I think it's very important. It was never as clean, unfortunately, as you That's right. thought it was. Uh, and, it, and I think the idea of objectivity was always a myth, uh, even those who thought they practiced it. But Geneva, the word transparency, I really, really hope you, uh, we embrace it. And, and that because it's understanding where that information is coming from is more important than thinking somebody is applying their values of what's right and wrong. Because as there's, we practice journalism too many years with there's, there are only two sides to every issue. And why, by inviting the audience in, which is really the fundamental difference, is it's right. not about platform. I worked in newsrooms where I could not get reporters to pick up the telephone and talk to the public. They wouldn't, they wrote, they knew better than their audience. They wrote the stories, and when somebody wanted to complain, that's what they were taught in journalism. We, we're doing, we're, we're better. We know the right answer. But it's messy when you open the doors. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very complex how you interact with people. You've all seen comments that are, are, are very um, offensive. They, they don't raise the, the level of the dialogue. But it's, it is much more what democracy and information the public interest is all about. And that is, it's a push-pull. And it's, it's, it circles around, not the old push. Huh? And uh, like I say, it's messy. And it'll never be as straightforward again. Well, I would give, I, I would give you a, 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 I would answer your question by answering a different question, which is uh, we, we can't turn the clock back to what it was uh, because the whole environment is completely changed. But I think what Vicky says is really the key that I think we teach our students that it's not going to be that way anymore. There isn't going to be a voice of God that tells you that this is the way it is and ignore everything else. There's going to be a cacophony of voices and competing voices and those elements of teaching both media literacy on the one hand so that you can distinguish between fact and fiction and that you can understand the environment you're in. So I think that in, in, in and I really like Vicky's characterization, it is much messier than before and there's a lot of downsides to it. But within that mess, there's a lot of opportunity as well because it also allows more room for passion, for engagement, for civic engagement, and for the audience to fact check you, which didn't really uh, exactly. exist before. So uh, it's, not, it's not quite as scary as it might seem. That could be a new credo. Within that mess, there is great opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> one, we've got one over here and one over here and then... Uh, somebody over here had a question too. Yes. Okay. Good. So we'll start. I, I, I wanted to come back to uh, entrepreneurship and teaching entrepreneurship. Um, the business school community has been do, has been studying that uh, entrepreneurship for 20 years, 25 years. Um, are you leveraging, if and <laughs> however you leveraging, sort of what were learn, you know, what's been learned about entrepreneurship in a very different sort of? If uh, I could just, uh, what, I told you about the boot camp, the news entrepreneur boot camp. We did that in full partnership with the Marshall School of Business's uh, Greif Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. And I learned one heck of a lot. I mean, it, it was a learning experience for me. And we're going to do it again this coming May. And we're going back. We're going to tinker. We're going to tool. But we have a great partnership. So yes, and, and I know David. And we, our, our class invites a lot of people uh, in, in to talk of various segments, including non-news. Uh, their, their story uh, of entrepreneurship. Um, and so uh, it is new for uh, a lot of us to be teaching this, but it's not a new, as you say, it's not a new topic. And there are 
uh, some great stories out there. It's not, it, entrepreneurship, you know, interestingly, is not exactly science either. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, one of, uh, one of the leaders that uh, Vicky was talking about says that, you know, it's legendary that some of the, the ideas that come out of, uh, whether it's business school or whatever, that really hit it, you know, uh, Kinko's or whatever, you know, the people who develop them in college get Fs on their, you know, feasibility <laughs> plan, you know. So there's, there's not, um, it's not exactly science, but there are lessons, a lot of lessons to be learned, a lot of uh, things to avoid that we talk about. One of the delights to me as a newcomer, just very quickly, to, uh, to the University of Southern California is that there is a very rich collaboration among schools here. Annenberg, <laughs> just the journalism school alone, and certainly there are others in COM, has lots of connections with all of the art schools and a wonderful <laughs> uh, master's in specialized journalism program we have. We have connections with Viterbi, our very strong engineering school, with um, Marshall, definitely, and with others. So it, it, that, I mean, you know, we're part of a great university, and we'd be fools not to take advantage of it. And fortunately, Annenberg, I think we can say, is a rather respected part of this great university. And so people are eager, eager to partner with us. We'll move over here for, yes. The, there's a person in red, a woman in red back there. <laughs> a woman in red. <laughs> there's also some gold in the red. <laughs> I just wanted to find out about opportunities for undergraduate students at the Knight Digital Media Center. Do you have classes? Do you have any type of internships, uh, guest lectures? Um, our, our sessions are competitive for, for professionals, but we invite faculty and students to any and all of what we do. It's not a formalized, for they, they don't get credit, but they're invited uh, to sit in. We also, as I said, uh, most often we've had a few undergrads, but most often we have graduate students who will, we, there are our bloggers. We set up a, a blog for our individual uh, uh, they're usually a week long. What, what, what I do is usually about a week long. And they'll sit in the back of the room and they'll both cover it, which I love, but then they'll comment. And they'll, from their own perspectives as young journalists or citizens on, somebody's made a point here, well, on their blog, they'll, they'll have a critical view of that point. And that, again, is it's just don't, you're, you're not just uh, uh, repeating as you write, you are thinking about what you're writing and you're, you're turning it into something that is more of a, a live document than something that, but honestly, I hope we get more students in our sessions. They're very, the, the professionals we bring in love to interact with our students because they're the target audience of most of the media we bring in. Everybody's trying to interest them. Let's move over here. Yes. Hi, well, is it working? Um, I went, I am a graduate of the Berkeley Journalism School way back in 1970, and I just want to say to the gentleman back here, one of the things when I went through the journalism school, we were taught to do everything by, with, uh, according to all the historical figures in journalism, and at the time, there were no women professors, That's and right. no, I don't remember anybody of color actually. That's either. correct. And I was advised to become a weather girl. Right, and, that's right. Uh, well, that was branching out for a woman. <laughs> well, now they've integrated the weather people. Now the men can do it. <laughs> and so I just want to say it's refreshing for me to read uh, people of all levels of education on the internet. And even though maybe the dialogue isn't in highfalutin language, I'm getting a, a very, a much broader perspective Absolutely. than I used to get from the writers of Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and even the smaller newspapers, they were all white guys. And, you know, I, I loved reading the newspaper. I grew up with it. And so my daughter, uh, who's just <coughs> finishing up in Annenberg, she recently, she told me about a month ago, she just put out on her Facebook page something like, oh, there's nothing better than waking up in the morning with the newspaper and a cup of tea. <laughs> and she's one of the few students who still subscribes to a newspaper. <laughs> so she, she told me she got so many responses of people hugely on the side of, what about all the trees that are, you know, getting ruined and are, you know, decimated, <laughs> along with other people. Oh, yeah, that's so 
cool, you know, to do that. And I remember cuddling up with my parents and reading the comics. And so, you know, there's a nostalgic thing about it, but there's also a reality that we do have a much better um, insight into what's going on in a lot of places in the world. Maybe the Absolutely. level of discourse isn't as elevated as it was, but maybe with more people having access, maybe that will be part of the process of um, bringing up everybody's level. Of That's course. just a wonderful, wonderful yeah. observation. Fantastic. Right? Are you available to teach? And, and, <laughs> can I'd, I'd also like <laughs> not try. to point out you used the word discourse. And that's what it is. It's discourse. It's a conversation now, as opposed to a lecture. Sorry. That was rhapsodic. That's Thank good. you. <laughs> Who else? Down here. Uh, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Um, we're former CNN journalists, and uh, I'm a graduate of the Medill School. And I'm not one of those people who longs for the good old days, although I think they were really good. <laughs> but I think uh, I'm so pleased what, what you're doing here, because if journalism doesn't change, if we don't change, we're going to die. And I think that uh, more than ever, the profession is so relevant. All you have to do is look at what happened during the Iraq War. And I think in a certain sense, it was a failure of our profession. But anyhow, I commend you. And uh, we're, we're, we were a four uh, newspaper family, uh, be, mostly because we had to be. And now I open up my computer instead of getting the papers off the doorstep, and I have the world at my fingertips. I can go to your website and read what your students are writing. I could go anywhere. And I think you, you're, you're doing a great job. You all are a tough crowd. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody here is going to be really critical. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, up here in the front row. Yeah. I had a question on the revenue side of the equation. Um, the advertising on the internet seems to be, uh, maybe it's a small screen, big screen kind of thing, but I find, I'm finding a lack of stuff that really draws me. Uh, and the print still has that you know, big picture you can really look at it. So since that affects everything about entrepreneurship, I just wondered whether you study that, whether there are any studies or research going on about and what your observations are. Yeah, advertising is really struggling to find the, the right way to uh, to reach people on on the web, and you know when you think about the handheld um, device, in some ways that, that image ad, you know, the big full page ad that really that really knocks you out on your little handheld, you know, uh, that, that certainly doesn't work very well. There are. Uh, there are a lot of things that are going to be tried in advertising, and some of them are going to work. And, and I, you know, one of the one of the most promising things is that in, increasingly, um, and some of this we may not like exactly, but increasingly advertisers will find you. If 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 you're a good candidate for their product, they're going to find you, and with some specificity that didn't exist That's in great. the newspaper, where, where everybody got the you know ad, no matter what. They're, they're gonna they're gonna know that you like um, uh, running or something, and 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 they're gonna find you. And they're, so when you do something online, bingo, they're gonna they're gonna have your number, and they're and 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 that that ability to target and not to have to advertise for masses of people that will never be interested in 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 your products uh, is is one thing that will increasingly be um, apparent. You know, in the way that Amazon knows what kind of books you like, this will get better and better, uh, 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 more and more targeted. It may, it may, you know, for some people, it may get too close to. I don't want people to know that much about me. You know, that they can target me in that way. But um, that that is one of the big hopes I think that advertisers. Uh, it, it, have. Yeah, and it's already happening in the uh, the, the retail world. iTunes. Uh, you use the example of Amazon, but I t that technology and that uh, the intuitive idea that when you do every time you click, there are ways that that information in can inform folks trying to reach you. But it's it's much more sophisticated, and I, I, I miss the ads too. By the way, it's the only reason to take a newspaper these days. <laughs> I could say more about this. Let's have one last quick question, and then I know people have places to go. Um, this gentleman with the white shirt. How do you deal with the fact that a newspaper you can flip through a newspaper page like 827 and find an article on this new digital world? You'll never 
get that interesting little article that you know you're just flipping through? I have to go there. I have to tell you, I am the I'm a firm, okay. firm believer that the serendipity of, of, of digital, that you will see and get more information than you ever would in that, that moment. By link. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's just incredible, the serendipity that comes with the web versus uh, some editor decided to fill a hole with a little news of the weird. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing that I think Twitter has brought around is that serendipity, once again. And I, I completely agree with you that I like the fact that you had 30 pages, they're packaged by someone, and you were stumbling across something you weren't looking for, but you found interest uh, in. But I think we're fulfilling that need with other tools now on the web, and Twitter is one of these things where I do find myself stumbling across a lot of websites and stories that are even better than just pure serendipity, but serendipity because of my network of people I trust. And um, that's maybe even better. Well, there's also community that, that's the antithesis in a sense of the serendipity but produces serendipity because if the, mo the more that you are online and the more that you are engaged with online communities that have specific interests then they push content to you through their through links and through their social networks you ordinarily wouldn't find so if you're interested in the most bizarre stuff that you would have to stumble upon in a newspaper, you actually get a ton of that pushed to you every day through your social network uh, that's being pulled from all these newspapers. So it cuts both ways. But I'm with you. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite, you like I'm the not quite there yet on the, on the value of serendipity being repli uh, replicated on the, yes. on the web. There's so much time you have you know, in the morning for that cup of coffee. Right. There's just so much time you have. You know, by the time you boot up the machine, Go through the process. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hello. Yeah, but I, I there's still a productive uh, business model around that. Even though we're talking about the death of newspapers, there's been one newspaper that's been doing really, really well the last five years. Does anyone know what it is? Wall Street Journal. Well, Wall Street Journal's not bad, but The Economist has really skyrocketed in terms of subscriptions. They're, what you see is a magazine. They call themselves a newspaper, but people appreciate that every week they don't break news, but their analysis, their packaging, the serendipity of the stories you stumble across is really valuable, and right. they've seen their subscription numbers go way up. They have an incredible business model. Yeah. They have so many layers of products. That yeah. Bill, do you want the last word? I wanted to speak to uh, this young woman and her comment about Berkeley and um, how we teach here, um, because we are looking forward in lots of ways but as Geneva said, we're not losing really the, the fundamentals that have always made good journalism schools good, and that includes um, looking broadly at history because history does inform the present and uh, it informs it. It helps educate uh, in significant ways moving forward how we think about what we write about, how we write about it. The truth is there were never just two sides of the story, there were multiple sides of stories that the digital era now gives us an opportunity to pursue because now you can actually shoot somebody with a video camera uh, <laughs> and listen, listen to them firsthand. So there's the, the filter um, between the journalist and the reading public, viewing public, listening public is uh, very much removed uh, uh, compared with our times, our era. And I think that's a great thing moving forward because you do get a lot more honesty, uh, transparency. And one last thing, I was at a conference at your alma mater last winter where one of the panelists about the future of journalism was uh, a Wall Street media analyst. Uh, who came and talked to a room full of journalists. And she said um, there was a lot of gloom and doom about the print product, but she said there has never been a time in journalism's history that she's aware of where the journalism produced by media outlets everywhere uh, has been so strong. And the analysis that Andrew talks about in The Economist, other business models moving forward, there's never been a time in the history of our country where uh, journalists have been better educated, um, better able to bridge communities, um, this multicultural understanding 
of what America looks like this century. And uh, we're doing it here in lots of different ways. So, uh, But I, I was interested in your comment because that happened to a lot of my classmates at Columbia, a lot of the women. Um, sort of that that happily is changing although probably not fast enough but thank goodness it is I want yeah. to close by putting the focus on you all it is wonderful to have the warm support and engagement of the parents of our remarkable students and we all benefit from the wonderful upbringing that you have given them they are an extraordinary group of people and uh, what a fine thing that you are all here supporting them. This wonderful breakfast, a huge crowd. Uh, we thank you. And please join me in thanking my colleagues.